Uh, what I'd like to essentially do is tell you about um, work uh, that has been a very productive collaboration with Sarah Cherry's laboratory here at Penn to develop a pipeline uh, for the discovery of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, antivirals that, that initiated a, a little over two years ago when the, when the pandemics first broke here in the US and, and labs started shutting down. So, you know, with, with more than 500 cases reported worldwide and greater than 6 million deaths uh, and, and a little over two years into this uh, pandemic, um, a, a dearth of antivirals against uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, remains uh, to aid in treating infections uh, that escape protection from, from the highly uh, efficacious vaccines, uh, especially the, the variants of concern that, that evolve and rapidly spread. Uh, and so, um, you know, the impact of the newly circulating uh, BA2 variant, um, you know, in Europe and parts of Asia, Australia, uh, South America, and the East Coast here in the, in the U.S. Uh, remains to be, be seen. Uh, but, but having additional therapeutics in our arsenal uh, would certainly help combat um, the new surge of infection or when protection from uh, vaccination uh, uh, wanes. And so uh, the question that, that we set out was, is could, can we identify antivirals? Uh, using a, 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 an in vitro platform. And in particular, can we identify direct acting antivirals, which essentially target viral proteins um, that may have similar, but not necessarily uh, overlapping activity uh, with existing direct acting antivirals, such as you know, the monoclonal antibodies that neutralize uh, viral infection by, by binding or recognizing spike, uh, the protease inhibitor Paxlovid, uh, which is, uh, uh, inhibits the main protease, which is responsible for processing this uh, polyprotein peptide of non-structural proteins required for replication, as well as inhibitors uh, such as remdesivir or molnupiravir against uh, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Now, secondarily to that, we, can we identify host targets that are uh, hijacked by um, the virus and are required for its replication and subsequent spread. And, and, and the advantage of, of going after host-directed uh, or host-targeted uh, antivirals is that they may have broad spectrum uh, activity uh, against SARS-2 and, and the variants of concerns, but also uh, other viruses, uh, other respiratory viruses or other uh, uh, emerging pathogens uh, 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 throughout the world. Uh, and furthermore, um, um, uh, host-directed antivirals uh, would be less prone to mutational drift that drive uh, resistance uh, to many uh, direct act, uh, uh, to, to many direct acting antivirals uh, against uh, 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 viruses. In addition to to targeting uh, uh, human proteins and, and pathways such as entry factors, um, we're also very interested in whether there are ways to uh, immuno uh, or modulate the, the innate immune response or boost the innate immune response. So, so cells possess uh, many um, uh, pattern recognition receptors that sense pathogens and an, uh, elicit an innate immune response. For example, the expression and, and secretion of interferons to halt the spread of infections. And so we hypothesized that drug-like molecules that boost an innate immune signaling may represent a class of prophylactic drugs to suppress the infections uh, in people who have been exposed to uh, the, the SARS-2 uh, virus. And so, unfortunately, due to time constraints today, I won't tell you uh, about much about our efforts uh, from these screens, uh, but these data have uh, already been published, and I'll, I'll highlight it uh, towards the end of my talk um, today. Okay, so, um, so the assay that we primarily use for high throughput screening is a, is a high content um, microscopy based assay uh, where cells uh, infected with live virus are identified by staining uh, or immunostaining with, uh, uh, with an antibody against double stranded RNA. Um, uh, we can then uh, write algorithms that allow us to segment images to uh, identify uh, nuclei, which have been counterstained with the hoax dye, uh, as well as uh, and, and quantified a total number of cells as a measure of cell viability. And then the number of double positive, uh, I'm sorry, the, the number of double strand RNA positive cells to measure infection of cells in the culture. And uh, we have optimized this assay 
uh, for several cell models, including Vero cells, HOH7 cells, A549A2s, and, and CALU3s. Now, we routinely express the activity of a drug as percentage of uh, the DMSO control uh, or uh, POC, where an inactive drug uh, would essentially be 100% uh, of the DMSO control. And a drug like remdesivir uh, would be less than 5% uh, of the DMSO control. So for these assays, we, we essentially aim to uh, achieve about 50% uh, infection of the cell culture. Uh, um, and um, these assays uh, typically yield uh, a, a Z prime uh, of approximately 0 0.5, you know, across assay plates in, in our screens. The Z prime metric uh, is essentially a unitless measure of an assay's robustness based on the activity of the positive, and, I'm sorry, of the negative and the positive controls uh, in a particular assay plate, and a value of 0 0.5 or greater you know, is essentially an industry standard cutoff for uh, defining a, a robust high throughput screening assay. We've also used this assay to validate the potency uh, of candidate uh, 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 antiviral molecules in a dose response assay, where, which we have used to determine uh, the concentration at which 50% of the cells uh, may be dead or, or defined as the CC50 in, in, in these graphs highlighted by the green line as well as the concentration at which 50% of infection is inhibited by a, canta, a candidate antiviral defined as the EC50 and um, uh, graphed as blue lines uh, uh, in, the, in these graphs. And then we, the uh, selectivity index or SI represents the full difference between the CC50 and the ECC, uh, EC50 for any particular drug. And so throughout the remainder of my talk, uh, you'll see data from our screening validation expressed in this uh, particular format to uh, identify or classify or validate the activity of, of candidate drugs. So using this assay, we've, uh, we've optimized the pipeline uh, amenable to high throughput screening of both chemical and genetic libraries. In, in multiple cell models. Uh, we've done screening in CALUs, HUH7s, and, and Vero cells. Specifically, we plate cells in 384 well assay plates. Drugs are then added robotically to the assay plates and pre-incubated with the cells prior to uh, uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2 in a BSL-3 uh, facility. Cells are then fixed and processed for automated imaging and subsequent analysis to then identify candidate compounds that either inhibit uh, the uh, infection and or possibly uh, uh, enhance the infection uh, of cells uh, in, our, in our assay. We have uh, screened now more than uh, 20,000 drugs uh, from uh, several libraries, including an in-house repurposing library that is composed of roughly about 3,500 drugs. This includes 1,500 FDA-approved therapies and then another 2,000 drug-like molecules against uh, annotated molecular targets that have had a history of use uh, uh, in clinical trials for various uh, applications. Uh, we've uh, received another 3,500 uh, uh, compounds from NIH NCATS, uh, uh, the NIH NCATS library that are non-overlapping with our repurposing library. And then uh, uh, through a collaboration with Caliber funded by uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, we've screened Caliber's reframe a drug repurposing library, as well as several other uh, libraries and, and candidate uh, compounds uh, uh, from, the, from the literature. Now, the validation of these screens uh, has been published in, in, in multiple manuscripts uh, uh, over the last uh, year, year and a half, and uh, uh, there are several more that are, that are in preparation um, uh, from, from these uh, from these. Now, one thing uh, that we learned very early in the, in the screening project and was highlighted by Emma in, in the previous talk um, was that virus entry is very cell type specific. And so when we used Vero cells, which are African green monkey or HUH7 cells, which are, are, are routinely used uh, to study HCV infections, uh, we found that SARS-2 infection was, was highly sensitive to cathepsin inhibitors. And, the, and, and that's by the, the processing of spike for entry uh, uh, was requiring uh, the endosomal pathway and, and cathepsin activation. 
but highly insensitive to the, to the serine protease on the cell surface temperance too. In converse, respiratory cells such as Kalu3 uh, demonstrated the inverse relationship where the infection of Kalu3 cells was highly uh, sensitive to the TEMPRS2 inhibitor camistop, but very insensitive uh, to uh, inhibition um, by, uh, uh, of cathepsins. And in fact, infection of all respiratory cells that we use during our screening and our validation pipeline is sensitive to TEMPRS2 uh, inhibition with the exception of um, the A549-ACE2 model. And that's uh, likely because these cells fail to express appreciable levels of TEMPRS2. Um, uh, so uh, in this uh, uh, figure is a, uh, a qPCR-based assay uh, where camistat treatment of the cells reduced um, viral RNA um, by greater than a log, okay? Uh, in CALU3s, in uh, alveolar type 2 uh, cells uh, differentiated from IPS cells, as well as primary respiratory cells in an air-liquid interface culture. And so the implication from, the, from these data is that different cell models uh, may yield different classes of antivirals. And I think, you know, there's many examples of this in the literature uh, uh, today. So, uh, we decided that, that we were going to focus on uh, our, the results from our screening of the Calu3 cells, since these represent the cell type uh, that is uh, the primary site of infection and, and disease pathology. Uh, and um, and um, our screening campaign um, uh, basically identified 122 candidates with antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, with a selectivity index uh, greater than three, meaning that the, the, the antiviral activity is at least threefold greater than the uh, potential cytotoxic, cytotoxicity activity uh, of any uh, uh, candidate drug. Uh, I should say that uh, all of our screening uh, that, that we've done uh, to date has been with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, Washington strain that was initially isolated here in Seattle, Washington, in the U.S. and Seattle, Washington at the beginning of, of 2020. However, we've done uh, EOZOC validation with, with multiple variants and strains uh, that have emerged since uh, these initial, uh, this initial strain. Uh, we, can, we can broadly classify the candidates into several target classes with approximately 25% uh, targeting uh, kinases, uh, another 25% uh, of the, the drugs uh, identified from our screens target uh, host metabolism pathways and or our nucleosides, uh, with the remaining 50% uh, being uh, falling into several uh, potential interesting uh, classes, um, uh, target classes. And so because of the large percentage of approved antivirals that are, are nucleoside analogs, uh, we decided to initially focus um, on these molecules uh, for our validation studies. So the pipeline uh, for validation uh, uh, uses our uh, microscopy-based assay to uh, uh, determine the potency and efficacy uh, of candidate uh, antivirals using uh, several cell models, including CALUs, A549s, H2H7s, and, and, and viral cells uh, against multiple viruses, okay? So we, we've done testing against many of the, the variants, including alpha, beta, Gamma, Delta, and Omicron. Uh, we've tested uh, the activity of, of candidate uh, antivirals against MERS and uh, flu, as well as several of the non-pathogenic uh, coronaviruses, uh, um, including OC43 and, and 229E. Uh, validated drugs uh, were then further tested uh, using primary respiratory cells, uh, cultures using uh, qPCR, based assays to measure viral RNA either in cells or in the supernates uh, from infected cells. And collectively, the data from the microscopy assay and the primary respiratory cells uh, guided the generation of hypotheses to study mechanisms, uh, which candidates, uh, and, and to then ultimately determine which candidates should uh, proceed to preclinical studies and animal models uh, with the ultimate goal 
of uh, potentially defining and initiating uh, clinical trials uh, in uh, COVID-19 patients. So um, our screening had identified uh, 16 uh, candidate nucleoside analogs or anti-metabolites uh, with, with, with robust uh, activity against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and um, we identified uh, 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 drugs that were both purine-based as well as uh, pyrimidine-based uh, from, uh, in our, in our screens. But, um, but the activity of these nucleosides was extremely cell type specific, uh, suggesting that the dependency uh, of nucleoside pools in these different models is regulated differently. And, and we speculate that this is probably based on the mechanisms by which these nucleosides or, or anti-metabolites are taken up by cells and are processed, uh, once they enter the cells, um, um, to, to, to essentially uh, uh, exert their, their activity. Um, however, one thing that I, I think uh, exists is that there, there's a, a fairly good correlation between uh, the activity, the antiviral activity of these nucleosides in uh, lung uh, or respiratory uh, cell types compared to any of the other cell types. Um, when we when we look at them across all, all the models, and so uh, um, we wanted to to investigate, you know, the role of of nucleosides uh, and and nucleoside pools uh, more extensively uh, in, in our in, in our in future. So one approach um, that uh, we wanted to take was, was to to look at combining nucleosides because it's it's very clear that the success of monotherapy will be limited and that defining combinations with additive or synergistic activity you know, is an intense area of investigation across all of biology. And so we essentially came up uh, or designed a platform uh, to uh, in, in test uh, the activity of, of rational drug combinations by testing the activity of two drugs uh, in a two-dimensional matrix uh, where the concentration of one drug Okay, would be uh, tested against the dose response of the second drug and vice versa. And so then the data from these assays can be analyzed using a number of different uh, models uh, to determine uh, combinatorial activity. Uh, we we uh, tend to like the BLISS model uh, because, uh, the, uh, because uh, it, it takes into account both changes in efficacy as, as, as well as potency. And so the null hypothesis in BLIST is that the combination uh, of two drugs is additive and that positive numbers uh, uh, in this model would uh, infer uh, an increase in observed activity relative to the expected contributions of both uh, 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 from both drugs and that negative numbers would essentially infer antagonism. And so we basically now uh, have used this platform um, um, to uh, uh, test for combinatorial activity uh, of candidate uh, SARS-2 antibodies. We started um, basically by looking at, uh, um, you know, uh, remdesivir, which is, which is a adenosine analog, uh, and molnupiravir, okay, which is a cytosine analog, since both possess uh, submicromolar antiviral activity um, in CALU3 cells. The, uh, when we tested these uh, drugs or, or the combination of these two drugs uh, using this uh, BLISS platform, what we observed was that, is that uh, the drugs were additive in nature in terms of their abil ability to, to inhibit SARS-2 uh, infection uh, in vitro. And so this suggested that we had to look elsewhere if we were going to identify combinations that might synergize uh, uh, in, in um, preventing SARS-2 infection uh, in cells. From our screening campaign, we also identified multiple inhibitors of host cell nucleotide uh, biosynthesis as some of our top ranked uh, hits. In particular, we identified a couple inhibitors of uh, DHODH, which is the rate limiting uh, uh, step in uh, the de novo uh, permitting biosynthesis pathway converting dihydroorotate to orotate uh, in this process. 
In addition, pyrazofuran, okay, is an inhibitor of UMPESs, which is the next biosynthetic step downstream of, of, of DHODH, and suggests that SARS-2 infection in these cells is highly dependent upon pyrimidine pools generated by the de novo pathway. Now, on the purine side, we identified AVN 944, which is a next generation IMPDH inhibitor, uh, and which is responsible for the conversion of uh, inosine monophosphate to, to xanthine monophosphate in the process of, of uh, bios, uh, biosynthesis of guanosine uh, uh, in cells. And so both of these, in, uh, all three, I'm sorry, all four of these inhibitors showed robust antiviral activity in CALU3 cells with minimal toxicity uh, to the cells. So to determine uh, whether the activity of these drugs was on target, we treated CALU3 cells with an EC90 concentration of each of these drugs uh, uh, um, in the presence of various concentrations of purines and or pyrimidines. And so SARS-2 infection was restored uh, by pyrimidines only in cultures that were treated with uh, Brequinar and or pyrazofuran, and that the inhibition of infection uh, by IVN, AVN 944 was, um, uh, was restored only by uh, the exogenous addition of uh, guanosine to the cell cultures. So furthermore, uh, we did some uh, metabolomics here at Penn. David, you have two, two minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with uh, Chris Petrucci's group, uh, and found that uh, 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 cytosine, CTP and UTP were, were depleted in cells treated with um, these two inhibitors, whereas guanosine was, was deleted or depleted um, in AVN. So uh, we used uh, our, uh, um, our platform, our synergy platform, to test for synergy between the DHODH inhibitors uh, and pyrazofuran against uh, remdesivir and, I'm sorry, uh, 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 molnupiravir and remdesivir. And we saw very robust uh, synergy between uh, the, with these combinations uh, in um, uh, cells uh, infected with the SARS-CoV-2 Washington strain, as well as uh, with various uh, with variants of concern. As uh, what I've illustrated here is the variant, uh, the beta uh, variant, uh, uh, isolated from from South Africa. So this suggests that pyrimidine pools may be limiting in these cells and represent a vulnerability for targeting during SARS. Uh, CoV-2 infection. So I'm going to uh, jump ahead uh, a little bit here. Uh, we, we've confirmed the activity of these drugs uh, using primary alley cultures. Essentially, if we treat uh, uh, these primary alley cultures with these uh, various drugs, we uh, uh, observe um, some a reduction in viral RNA. Um, that is, uh, uh, but when we uh, uh, treat uh, or co-treat the cells with both uh, molnupiravir and either the DHOD inhibitors, we see an increased or a, a further de decrease in the amount of viral RNA in these cells. This is, uh, um, we, we observe these in both nasal epithelial as well as uh, alley cultures uh, derived from bronchial epithelial tissue. And we use then this data then uh, in a collaboration with Matt Freeman's group uh, at the University of Maryland to uh, test this combination in an in vivo model of SARS-CoV infection in, in mice. Uh, basically, if we treat with uh, molnupiravir, okay, we see a, a reduction in uh, the amount of a vi viral titer in nasal washings from, from mice uh, infected with uh, the beta uh, uh, virus. Uh, and that uh, this, uh, these viral titers can be further reduced by adding in uh, uh, con non-toxic concentrations of Brequinar. In addition to uh, reducing viral titers, we also observed a decrease in the pathology or the inflammatory pathology in tissues with, uh, uh, between, uh, uh, with uh, the addition of Brequinar on top of molnupiravir, uh, uh, suppressing uh, the inflammatory uh, uh, phenotype in, in, these, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this histology uh, based assay. So I'll finish with, with one or two last slides. Um, we, we've now moved on to, to looking at um, the, the orally available uh, protease inhibitor Paxlovid uh, in our system. Uh, the main protease is responsible for uh, processing this poly, 
uh, protein peptide um, that, uh, that's translated from, from the mRNA into non-structural proteins that are required for the replication. Uh, we can see is that Paxlovid is, is highly uh, effective in, uh, with a, a submicromolar IC50 and minimal uh, toxicity in, in, our, in our system. Uh, we've looked at the activity of Paxlovid against a, a panel of uh, variants of concerns, including MERS and, and the non-pathogenic uh, 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 coronaviruses. Uh, and it shows broad spectrum uh, uh, antiviral activity uh, against all of these particular strains, uh, with maybe the exception of 229E. And uh, we've gone on to further test the, uh, uh, for uh, combinatorial activity between molnupiravir and Paxlovid, primarily because both drugs are orally bioavailable uh, and would make for a very nice combination. Um, but um, these in vitro studies indicate uh, that uh, the, the drugs are acting no more than additive uh, in, uh, in our particular assay. So in, uh, in conclusion, what we've done um, over the last two years is built a, a, an antiviral di drug discovery pipeline um, for coronaviruses, but goes beyond that. Um, we are, we've done uh, more screening against arboviruses and uh, some other uh, viral phylogeny looking for host-directed uh, uh, or host-targeted antivirals that may have broad spectrum. Uh, I already mentioned to you that we have a program looking for uh, um, uh, drugs that may boost Im innate immune signaling, which we published in Science Immunology about a year ago. Um, but we're also diversifying our platform to screen for uh, direct-acting antivirals by screening a, 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 a more focused collection of nucleosides as well as other libraries focused on uh, other potential target classes, including proteases, uh, um, um, and applying what we learn from these screens um, to more extensively do synergy screening, um, as well as use uh, omics and genetic approaches, including siRNA screening to identify pathways or validate pathways uh, that have uh, antiviral activity against uh, um, against the broad uh, panel of, of, of viruses. So um, uh, this is, you know, obviously a, a large amount of work, um, you know, in the, in the high throughput screening core here, um, uh, Canapria, Brenda, and David have been uh, um, instrumental in, in running screens and, and, and data analysis. Um, uh, in Sarah's laboratory, this has been a, a you know, a, a, a huge collaboration between the core and Sarah's lab, and I want to point out uh, early contributions from Mark Dittmar, who was a technician and now a student in at Penn here, and Jesse Miller. We've had a number of uh, collaborations and funding from NCATS, the Bill Mill and the Gates Foundation, NIAD, and Caliber to, to support uh, uh, this work, as well as uh, numerous other uh, collaborations that I haven't talked about here today, uh, and numerous funding sources, too many to, to really mention other than uh, the synergy work was was uh, basically funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So uh, I'll end there and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that people may have. Thank, thank you, David, an amazing amount of work and, and really uh, quite impressive. We have time just for one or two questions. And uh, for people who don't get to ask questions, please type them into the Q&A. And David, you can go in there and, and type in uh, answers. Yeah. Um, so are there questions? You can use the raise hand function or um, the Q and A. So I, I can start with one, and again, we'll just have to go quickly. Um, I noticed you used remdesivir, which has not been clinically that impressive as kind of the standard for your assays. And uh, I would imagine you're hoping to do better than remdesivir. Well, I mean, I think, you know, there's a disconnect between how well it works in, in, uh, in the clinic versus how well it works, say, in an in vitro assay like ours, okay? So, you know, remdesivir has been primarily used in hospitalized patients who um, are, have fairly severe disease. And so uh, I think, you know, it's, it's failure in the clinic may just be because of the severity of the disease and the point at which you know, patients are being administered uh, remdesivir because it has to be done, uh, you know, intravenously. And right. that we pretty much focus, we're starting to focus on orally avail uh, bioavailability, mm. like molnupiravir and Paxlovid, uh, because those drugs potentially have 
the opportunity to be given earlier, uh, you know, in, a, in an, in, you know, upon infection. You know, so as soon as a positive test, they may be sure. given um, when, when symptoms uh, may be less severe. That makes sense. I, I could jump in, David. I just thought it was interesting, the incredibly strong cell type dependence of those. I'm, I'm guessing the pools of nucleosides are wildly different, or maybe the synthetic uh, machinery yeah. for making the nucleosides. I wondered how much we knew about it. You know, it bears on HIV uh, efficacy of a lot of the drugs also, where the, you know, with Sam HD1 depleting the pools. And so it seems like a lot of fun to look at that levels of pools. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um... Yes, I think that these are great questions and, you know, obviously can stimulate a longer discussion, but I, I think, you know, different cells and clearly, clearly in the context of cancer biology, nucleoside pools and how they're utilized by different cancer models and so forth impacts uh, efficacy of therapy, both in vitro and in vivo. So uh, I think there are probably, we speculate that there'll be similar stories, um, but we don't have details of, of per se how that impacts, you know, the efficacy of therapy, you know, in, in these in vitro systems and, and how that may impact efficacy. In